Well, all of you in the audience have spoken. My pain and suffering is simply too delightful to pass up. So here we are to talk about the not-so-positive side of the show. You know, in hindsight, I probably should have made you do this one first. But hey, at least now you're gonna get that sweet holiday negativity revenue. I suppose that's what the holidays truly are about at the end of the day. Besides the social obligation to give presents, of course. Uh, speaking of which, happy holidays! Here is a $25 gift card for Steam. Go nuts. This only has $13 left. You're welcome. And before I go on, I want to make it clear that for all the faults we're about to discuss, this in no way diminishes how much I adore Death Battle. To expect every single one of their 150 plus episodes to have banger deaths is absurd. And while there are plenty of lame endings to go around, making this list was honestly more of a challenge than I thought it would be. It's no secret that reviewers revel in bad media, as it gives a lot to talk about, and negative opinions are not only fun to write, but generally fun to watch too, depending on the review of course, but a majority of this show's bad deaths don't give me nearly as much to discuss as its finest moments. Most of the time it boils down to being super boring and or visually unappealing, i.e. mostly vaporizations. So to get on this list, the rules are pretty identical to last time, just in reverse. Being out of character, lack of buildup, creatively bankrupt, disrespect with no nuance, but most importantly, being bad in a way that's worth dissecting. And it does have to be a death scene, so you won't be seeing Deadpool vs Pinkie Pie here. Ooh, that reminds me, I uh, haven't gotten Pinky anything yet. Uh, you uh, think she likes Daniel Radcliffe movies? As negative as a list like this inherently is, I still have positive things to say about pretty much every entry here, aside from number one, and you'll see what I mean. But first, we've got to work our way up the crap mountain. It was once said that the journey of a thousand miles begins with just one step. Too bad our first step in this particular case is bordering on sacrilege. Ooh, starting off strong with the My God Could Beat Your God episode, I see. Let's be clear, just because an episode lands on this list, that doesn't automatically make it bad. Funnily enough, whereas last time I only had a handful of episodes to mention that I didn't like, I'll be going through quite a few episodes in this video that managed to be good in spite of their lackluster finishers. Which sort of flies in the face of my message from before about how essential endings are, but that's because one of the other factors to land an entry here is disappointment. When everything leading up to it is fun and exciting, it makes that final, sour note stick out so much more. And you know what? I really do like this episode for how out of the box it is. I can't wait to see the team take on more out there fights in the future. One of these days, serial mascot royale. One of these days. The actual fight has some wonderful sprite work and an engaging framing device with the narration, but by the time we get to the celestial stuff, things get a little messy. The idea of their celestial beings getting in on the action to acknowledge their godhood is neat stuff, staying in line with this episode's unique flair. You know what else is unique about this episode? I can't think of a single other fight that literally spoils its outcome mid fight. I'm not talking about threats or callbacks or Wiz and Boomstick being jerks. I mean literal spoilers. The Monkey King emerged vic- no! Even if it's just for a second before the final blow, it still seriously undermined the tension. Apparently, these sprites from before were supposed to show Heracles being killed, but the overexposed glow and the disorganized sprites make it impossible to make out on a first viewing. And what was that final blow again? I struck him so hard he was reduced to nothingness. Oh, thank you so much, Sonny Boy. I never would have known that if you hadn't pointed it out. Seriously, who talks like that? Wow, I shot that guy so much his brain resembles Swiss cheese. Golly gee, I sliced that guy's head off so hard that it exploded once I threw it. True story. No, really, it... It's true. It's at the very bottom because it's still visually pleasing, and despite it being a vaporization, I like the inky touch and how it stays in line with the storytelling tone. Come on, death battle, that all you got? This is seriously the worst you have to offer with vaporizations? <laughs> You know what? It's really strange the kinds of things that'll happen when you tempt fate. As I'm sure you all could surmise from my attitude last time, this is far from the only Season 5 episode to make it on here. Though I'll be honest, this ending doesn't do a whole lot that's technically wrong. It's cool seeing Strange acknowledge their gap in power by going astral and taking things to Jotaro vs Kenshiro land, only for him to get dogged on, but it leaves with this sense of emptiness, not unlike Strange's corpse. It's too low-key of a way to end a fight that should be so cosmic in scale. Even the music sounds like it's falling asleep. But more than that, it's just hard to take it seriously. Everyone knows about the infinity gender meme, the only thing missing is Shadow the Hedgehog showing up. As for the actual death, I honestly can't think of another vaporization this 
perplexing. Why do all of his limbs disappear except for the right leg? Is he like that one idiot from Lady in the Water who intentionally works out one side of his body, except he didn't want to skip leg day but misconstrued it as only working on one leg since it isn't legs day? I guess I wasn't all too impressed by the assault orchestrated by man, woman, and infinity. But you gotta give this vaporization credit for not being a bore. After all, when someone says boring vaporization, usually this is one of the first things to come to mind. Even after all these years, I'd still posit Ryu vs. Scorpion as the quintessential fighting game episode. Tight choreography, awesome music, and a really lame death. Seriously, with only a few exceptions, it feels like fighting game episodes are cursed to have the absolute most boring deaths. Even seeing Ryu get teleported into the lava, while cheap, would have probably been more visually intriguing. But no, Ryu gets his obvious final form moment and wins the episode in just one hit, leaving only a skeleton behind. Is what I would say if it wasn't actually a fake out that leads to an equally uninteresting death. It'd be like if in Thor vs Vegeta, Thor came back only to god blast Vegeta into dust. To be fair, it probably would have looked better than the PNG of ashes we got here. That's not to say this climax is helpless. The fake out legit fooled me and the animality was funny, but it still feels like another comes and goes kind of death that doesn't suit the action we had gotten before. All these vaporizations being lumped together is starting to get on my nerves. Can we please get something different next? Careful what you wish for. Damn it, Ryu, I wasn't talking to you! The fact that both of Ryu's episodes are bangers with not so banging endings has to be intentional, right? Stick to street fighting, Ryu. Murder clearly isn't your thing. But I can't put all the blame on Ryu. It's all because of that stupid final form of his. I mean, it's literally called the power of nothingness. No shit that it means there's nothing to his closing moves. The moment by itself, honestly, is pretty great. Seeing Ryu on the brink of destruction as the music dies down and those pupilless eyes show up does bring genuine chills. And they did not need to go as hard as they did with the instrumentation during the beam. It's so badass. But other than that, there's not much else to latch on to. Boomstick claims there's nothing in Jin's stomach, so I have to assume the attack gutted him. But all we get is a shot of his body from behind and a trail of blood that may as well have been a smear from paint.net. Ugh, come on. If you're going to blow a hole through somebody, the least you can do is show it off. Strut those battle scars. You know, most people wouldn't consider a hole in their chest a scar like you, Mr. Healing Factor. Well, Ryu certainly does. And might I say he is crushing the topless look. What puts this further than Ryu's last bout is that it doesn't even have a fake out to make it any more interesting. Not to mention everything from before is still easy top 10 fights of the show material. I love this episode to pieces. That's why the lackluster ending stings all the more. Because I know it deserves better than that. Ryu deserves better than that. And I could tell you two other characters that deserve better too. Talk about being a victim of your era. With the exception of Master Chief and Peter Parker, I'm pretty sure Kratos and Spawn are the two characters from season one that desperately need a modern run back the most. Not against each other, gods no. It's just that with how epic and badass they and their home series are, it's no wonder people want to see something more, uh accurate to their coolness. Now I did my best to keep season 1 entries to a minimum since they're the definition of low hanging fruit for a list like this, but there are some that cannot be abided even by season 1 standards. To this episode's credit, it is our first fake out kill ever, which is totally different from kills where it takes a second to realize who's actually dead. Other than that one sort of positive, do I even need to say why this one sucks? It's not hard to grasp, and it's not like there isn't any decent build up either. When Kratos breaks through the chains, it makes you think, yeah, okay, I can't wait to see where this is going. Uh, nowhere, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Remember Alucard versus Spawn? Yeah, why don't we take two supernatural, infamous for being impossible to kill fighters, and have it end with a little slish and the most tame blood splatter effect that was used in fucking every indie animation back in the day. Be careful what you wish for, Ghost Rider vs. Spawn enthusiasts. Spawn's just gonna gently pop that cute little skull off and call it a day. Who's there at those? Seriously, I've seen kids playing with their action figures come up with more brutal deaths. Hey, hey, hey! All hope isn't lost, Nate. Boomstick is clearly a die hard spawn fan. I'm sure he'll have some kind of resurgence. That's even sadder, arguably. I mean, what's the last thing Spawn got other than a Mortal Kombat cameo? An angry video game nerd episode? It's not like this era was incapable of elaborate kills, too. I guess what I'm trying to say is that with characters like these, there's a certain amount of expectation when it comes to the violence. So by that logic, our next entry isn't as bad as we thought after all? I guess we should give some leeway since they intentionally made the death tame in case any little kids who like My Little Pony clicked on it. But that sentiment is swiftly undercut by Mr. Timeha and his boot-stomping shenanigans. <laughs> 
Even barring the lack of gore, what exactly happens? Raven gets turned into Planty the Potted Plant, Twilight reads some Twilight, and then she gets bomb rushed by Raven's soul self right after delivering one of the most cringy one-liners of the show. And it's not like Twilight is a quipper in her series. She'd be much more likely to deliver a monologue about how anger and hate can't overcome the magic of friendship before technically being proven right. Does Raven ever get drinks with her soul self? And I think I could be considered a pretty reliable source for all things Pony at this point. As for the real death, I get that it's supposed to be yet another fake out to catch us off guard, but this does that in such a lazy way. It seemed more like the soul self had evaporated from before rather than getting some kind of running head start, making it the kind of shock that feels unearned as well as underwhelming due to the lack of destruction. I can't bring myself to despise this one though since they did a good job making their hacks feel really close and down to the wire, and the soul self's design looks genuinely awesome having every frame being a different drawing. Speaking of every frame being special, it's chilling time again. Oh, good segue, Shafrilis. Movie Palette is a fascinating company that produces artwork for your favorite movies, but what sets them apart is that they're paintings with a secret. While they're unassuming at first glance, the brilliant thing about movie palettes is that each one consists of various stripes of colors that are carefully chosen by a talented team of artists, and every stripe represents a color of a particular scene from that movie. You can get your canvas with a satin matte finish at a 0.75 inch depth or a chemically perfect gloss finish at a 1.25 inch depth. It also fits neatly into any interior and is simple really nice to look at. They're guaranteed to last for years thanks to the high quality materials and the most up-to-date printing technology. Click the link in the description below to head on over to Movie Palette's website and enter the promo code CARRIC15 to get 15% off your first product. There is a vast library of movies to choose from, such as comedies, thrillers, action, drama, and more. And even if they somehow don't have the movie you're looking for, all you have to do is tell them the name and year of the movie you want, and they'll create a custom Movie Palette just for you. Again, that's C-A-R-R-I-C-K-1-5 if you want to get 15% off your first product. It's a great way to support the channel and perfect for those who are looking for an original gift with sentimental value. Enjoy your painting with a secret today. What can I say? I'm a sucker for whenever the show goes the hand-drawn route. It makes me feel giddy, especially given how rare the fully hand-drawn fights are. But as much as I praise a few of them in the best list, that doesn't mean they're all winners. Case in point. Die already! You first. While I don't agree with them, I can see where people who find Omni-Man vs. Homelander too short are coming from, but this episode has a bad case of dragging things out, mostly towards the end of the fight with the beam struggle. They did not need to make Genos use the same move four consecutive times to get the point across. And why is Rhodes standing still in the first place? Just walk through the goop! You're intangible, my dude! This episode also suffers from MCU-itis, fitting in this case, I guess, where it doesn't know when to shut the fuck up. All you had to do was end it at Genos self-destructing and Rhodes surviving. That would have been totally serviceable, but it just had to get in that quirky character is just a head moment before the real kill. I like mine better, even with the unkeyed green screen. The fact that this episode predicted love and thunder in a roundabout way is kind of impressive, honestly. Visually, this episode is still very easy on the eyes. In fact, that's something that still holds up for most season 7 episodes. Even if the movements weren't always smooth, I can appreciate how much experimentation went into giving each episode a look that was exclusively their own. But beauty is skin deep, as they say. It takes more than just looking nice to leave an impact, especially when that impact is a fraction of a fraction of what the characters are capable of. I honestly feel terrible for all the Wonder Woman fans in the audience. The fact that her best episode is one that's practically unfinished says a lot. You can go ahead and consider that death a part of the dishonorable mentions, by the way. God, this face is stupid. Same goes for the death from Rogue versus Wonder Woman, and I'd honestly prefer not to even think about that episode right now. Well, is that when she's unconscious? I can there are laws, you know. As pretty as this episode is, that's not enough to master the monumentally cringe dialogue and boring choreography that peeks at this sword scuffle. I don't buy She-Ra being able to break Wendy's gauntlets at all, the battle's minuscule runtime does no favors for the out-of-nowhere kill, and need I remind you that this is Wonder Woman, one of DC's heaviest hitters? All we get is some cut-down trees and a decapitated head that for some reason still has the hair intact. Oh. Okay, why not take advantage of the whole molecular level cutting gimmick and show Shiraz Adams being sliced followed by an explosion with some semblance of impact? Also, give Wendy a better line or just have her say nothing. Anything that doesn't make me sick to my stomach from all the cringe. That's what power really looks like. Can we please just talk about a good episode? Oh, thank you. The death may suck, but you can always rely on Berserk to put you in a good mood.
but that doesn't sound right. Revisiting this episode made me really happy to see that it was just as good as I remembered. I still believe that it has some of the best sound design of any early episode, giving each clang and slice the perfect amount of reverb and oomph. And holy cow, that death scene. Guts is on the ropes but doesn't let up with his tenacity, powering through the pain and landing an awesome disarm and decapit thrust. What a metal finisher! I- Oh, there's still more? Well, I'm sure it's just as- That's it? No. No! You're telling me that they decided to follow up that epic moment with a Cinder cameo that got defeated in one slice? Right? I know that they had to include this last bit, final forms go burr after all, but way more than that had to be done to follow up what we were shown beforehand, and with the banger, not the fizzle. Eh, at least the armor sprites look cool, and the sound design is still superb. And hey, at least the kill is on screen. Now you guys truly know why Blake vs. Mikasa edges this episode out in my season 8 ranking. The former has an on-point death, this one has a pointless death. I assume at least. If only they had the balls to show us the kill in this Mortal Kombat episode! At least in Blake vs. Inuyasha or Poseidon's death in God of War 3, we're being shown the victim's perspective, which is arguably way more gruesome. This episode doesn't have that excuse, and I still haven't forgiven it for the amount of disrespect Akuma got throughout. To get what I truly mean, here's how the Chad Goro reacts to getting his arm ripped off, and here's how the Virgin Oni reacts to the same thing. This is the villain that makes Liu Kang look like the nicest guy in the world? Also, that was an unearned flawless victory line from Khan given the actual hole in his chest. Oh shit, maybe you do have a point, Wade. I wasn't lying when I said disrespect is a big factor for this list. When I told y'all that disrespect will earn a spot on this list, there's one infamous episode I'm sure was on everyone's minds. Who's that? Frickin' sixth chaos event. I have a really hard time talking about this episode. Is it actually bad? It's like calling Spider-Man 3 bad. A flawed product for sure. But is it right to ignore how entertaining it is? Well, for the purposes of this list, I decided to put my foot down. Especially after reviewing so many deaths from before that are entertaining as well as competent. Like Shadow's last episode. I laugh at it because that was the intention. I laugh at this episode because of everything it gets wrong. Shadow has no personality to speak of and is even given a purposefully awful voice performance. Though so let's be real, it's not that surprising. Oh, screw you! The clash between their final forms is just a bunch of generic DBZ effects, and the ultimate weapon that vanquished the ultimate life form was the legendary Spoon.png. Not only is it as lame as it sounds, it doesn't even have much shock value going for it since we had already seen the spoon get used beforehand. Points for creativity, I suppose. Killing with a spoon is pretty tricky. And all things considered, I can't appreciate Mewtwo winning with his superior mind, which doesn't happen very often in this show. It's almost as rare as their live action battles, which we only have two, uh, three in total of. Ahem. <clears throat> Four. Oh yeah, how'd I forget Chad's waffle story? I won't beat around the bush, you all knew these two were inevitable to appear on this list. The real question was, which would I like better? Well, after a long, arduous minute of deliberation, Red Hood netted the trophy for best live action death on death battle. You did it, good so job, I can't believe it, I'm proud of you. The pieces are in place, there's no doubt about that, the Venom power-up was well done, and the gun exploding on Jason was a neat callback to a seemingly throwaway line from the analysis. This build-up is serviceable, but not enough to justify the kill that really does come out of nowhere. It's not even a bad kill in concept, it's just too abrupt it makes you go, huh. Question, if Bucky was able to crush Jason's helmet with a single squeeze, how come he wasn't able to break through earlier during the fisting barrage? Uh, also, if you look closely, the light in his eye goes out, but then in the next shot, it's shining again. Fucking terrible episode! I can at least appreciate Bucky's characterization by showing his cold attitude and how it's just another mission for him. This last shot is well framed too, but it really seemed like it was hinting at Jason getting back up. If only Jason had asked himself this question before the fight, what would Batman do? Probably something a lot dumber. You know, I never realized that Bucky vs. Jason is really just Batman vs. Captain America, but with guns. Now let's not be too hard on Bruce. He's not a killer after all. <laughs> Except for when the writers forget. He doesn't know the proper way to make lethal moves cool. So much like the dad trying to impress his kids, Bruce overcorrected his non-lethal ways and went for a move that was so over the top it's far more comical than novel. Now for those who haven't seen this episode or simply forgot, I'll give you a play-by-play. -play. 
<clears throat> After getting smoke screened, Steve haphazardly throws his shield into the fog, waits like a dumbass, and gets explosive gelled in the face, followed promptly by Bruce pressure pointing and uppercutting him so hard he flies into the air above the buildings before magically lassoing his grappling hook around Steve's neck to say Yori him, and finally dismembering Steve with a toss of his shield. I am not making this shit up! <laughs> okay, first of all, how did Bruce get a better display of strength in this episode than Diana and her she fight? Oh well, the bat symbol was at least a fun twist, even if it was unearned. Even my cameo in that fight made for a better twist. What if at least made for a better use of Steve? Were you able to see that fast enough, Stevie? Stick to being the victim, Batman. That seems to be your strongest suit on this show. There is at least some entertainment to be found in this one, being so ridiculous that it ends up being pretty funny. It's at least better than a death that just makes you really, really, really sad. What, you thought I meant like Tondro versus Jonathan sad? I wish. I am dead serious when I say the lengths to which this episode disrespects Luigi genuinely upsets me. Our precious green bean did not deserve to be done so dirty during his year. Nintendo was already doing that plenty. This isn't supposed to be a review of the whole episode, but a big reason this death is so vile is how little Luigi got to shine throughout the fight. With only one meaningful beatdown, the whole time you're waiting for that heroic moment where he gets to prove himself. Instead, we get a music change that makes you think an epic final struggle is about to happen, only to get a far too sudden boxing glove kill. And we focus so much on shadow getting done dirty. At least he got his redemption arc. Remember when I said Peter and Chief need runbacks? Well, it better not be until we live in a world where our Mr. L is given the proper justice he deserves. Long live the year, nay, the dynasty of Luigi! Okay, that's enough positivity for a worst of list. Let's get back to tearing this show a new one. You're right, it's season one dunking time again. Old internet charm can only take you so far. The reason we want to see our favorite characters die brutally is because it shows how far they'll push themselves to the very end. Season one had explosions, buzzsaws, vor. These are all hardcore ways to go out swinging. Not sure if I'd count vehicular manslaughter. Manslaughter, doctor? I did that shit on purpose. So what exactly separates a death like this from something like Bomberman, Vegeta, or Pikachu? Couldn't Riptor also be argued as a comedic death? Well, for starters, it's not very funny. Second, a comedic death has to feel earned, or at least thematic in some way. Dig Dug used Bomberman's weapon against him in a way similar to the mechanics of his home series. Shadow's super form running out was meant to convey how Vegeta's tenacity helped him win, and it's a classic line. Blanca is a jungle monster that eats small animals. No brainer. Oh, I, I see, cause, cause he lost his good one, clever. What does Riptor falling to her death on a car have to do with Killer Instinct? This battle is an infamous example of one combat and dominating than dying out of nowhere. And the short runtime certainly doesn't help the abruptness of the final move either. Yoshi, despite being treated like a wuss, had a pretty cool string of combos that led to the inevitable Vor move. Though there's not much else going for this ending, especially since Mark Haynes took the concept of Yoshi swallowing his opponent and struggling to make the egg and made it a thousand times better a decade later. It's also pretty insulting the more you think about it, because it implies that Yoshi only won from getting lucky with a conveniently placed cliff. You know, the same Yoshi that did this. Even when he wins, he's still loses. Well, we've made it to the bottom 10, and everything up to now can be considered short stacks in comparison to the amounts of suckage we're about to subject ourselves to. Leading the pack is Gray versus Esdeath. Something about ice-related kills doesn't really do it for me. More often than not, they feel weak and are hard to read. And in this battle's case, I can barely read it at all. If you're gonna have your character do an I'm taking you with me kind of move, you have to do a lot to justify it as a necessary last resort. To be frank, the only time I've ever seen it done well remotely was with All Might versus Mike Guy, and the death from that episode isn't even that good. Gray was schooling as death in the sword fight. Then after a few swings, he's like, gee whiz, it's taking me longer than three minutes to beat this lady. Better activate my no life move. Then as death freezes time and things are already starting to get hard to follow. But then as death harpoons Gray after making the dumbest sprite face on the show, and the fight just ends. Full disclosure, I've only seen a few episodes of Fairy Tale, so I'm not super knowledgeable on the rules of that universe. That being said, the fuck happened? If the stabbing killed Gray and halted the lost ice shell, then why did he still freeze? Should it not have halted his ice too? Please tell me in the comments. I've been trying to figure this ending out for the last two and a half years and have yet to come up with a reasonable answer. Like most ice deaths, it's incredibly anticlimactic, but this added layer of confusion is enough to earn it a spot in the top 10. Who knows, maybe the fairy tale fans will end up telling me that this death wasn't so bad, and the way Gray died was perfectly logical. Perhaps it's best if I stuck to my own lane when it comes to how well a character is represented. Well, I love me some Full Metal, and Avatar is probably the greatest cartoon of the 2000s. Yeah, you all know where this is going. Oh, shit! Not 
that, Ken! As I said in my last video, the deaths of Season 6 were a major step up from Season 5, but there's one death that holds it back from a perfect record. Welcome to Character Assassination the Episode, starring Not Aang and Insert Short Joke. On its own, the death is nothing to write home about one way or the other. It's just another kind of flashy vaporization. Not much to add on that front. It's the way these characters are interpreted that piss me right the hell off. And yes, I'm allowed to be angry since I've seen and enjoyed both of their shows, especially since this was our introduction to Full Metal as well as the second time an Avatar episode sucked. Alright, so, Edward using his wits after getting disarmed? Pretty good. Committing to the Napoleon Complex bit down to his final moments of life? Pretty fucking stupid. But what's even dumber is what they did to the purest boy in fiction. Right off the bat, even including a character like Aang on this show is already stretching things. But if they just had him go into his avatar state to kill Ed and be done with it, that would have been fine. But they couldn't friggin' help themselves and just had to include that last little bit of dialogue. You left me no choice. I'll admit, destroying a character in one line is pretty impressive, especially when you make a character who went out of his way to spare a fucking war tyrant voiced by Mark Hamill say he had no other choice when fighting a random guy who had already been severely neutered in power. He only activates the state when he or his loved ones are in real danger, not when some rocks give him a minor inconvenience. I said minor. Maybe have one of Ed's attacks accidentally harm Momo. It would have at least justified the transformation in anger more. Seriously, what the hell else were you afraid Ed might do? Make your ear drums bleed from screaming some more? And don't say the Avatar State sent him into a blind rage, that's not how it works. Yes, he's lost control in the past, but it's still Aang under there, and he explicitly learned how to control it after unlocking his chakras, which came in handy for the time he spared a war tyrant voiced by Mark Hamill! But you want to know the real kicker about this ending? If it had been made this season, you know they would have played it off like Aang killed by accident after going berserker mode and have a scene of him breaking down after realizing he violated his principles, maybe even throwing Momo in to comfort him so it's not a complete downer. We here at Death Battle love the taste of salt, whether it comes from butthurt fans or traumatized characters. This whole ending screams missed opportunity, but I don't want to be too hard on it given the time frame of when it came out. The show has gotten a lot more comfortable with emotional endings ever since the overwhelmingly positive reaction of Saitama vs. Popeye. So that's hindsight for ya. It's important to test the waters before plunging yourself into the dark abyss, which is why experimentation is so important for seeing what does and doesn't work. On an unrelated note, here's Nightwing vs. Daredevil. I am a stupid sandwich! Ah, prick. Looking back on this one with the knowledge of a second live action episode under our belts, this being the first one has become a lot more noticeable. Now I think it still holds up in plenty of facets, but one of the biggest issues to hold this one back was the absence of stakes, for lack of a better word. Cartoons can be as brutal to each other as they damn well please. These are real dudes pretending to punch each other, except in their case, it hurts. One misplaced blow or stunk on awry is enough to kill a normal person. Combine that with a small budget, and it's pretty clear the team was limited in the amount of ways they could end this death battle without hurting someone as well as their own wallets. Well, a bit of bad luck. It's not like they were starved for creativity either. The original plan was to drop a car on him for Pete's sake. And therein lies the biggest reason live action is so rare on this show. There are so many more factors to take into account, and it doesn't take much for a plan to fall through or a scene to need reshooting. So that's why I think at the end of the day, we should cut this and any future episodes that attempt to take the live action plunge a little slack. That being said, this weak ass punch still sucks eggs like damn bro. At least it was a decent reference. What? Yeah, that punch was clearly a reference to Nightwing the series. You know, the series that the guy who played Nightwing made eight years ago. Ah, cool. You still don't know what I'm talking about, do ya? Dude, Ismahawk hasn't posted to their channel in forever. You think I can remember all these things? Can we just get to the part where you show the clips side by side to show I'm not gaslighting you? Ugh, <sighs> fine, what up? Wait, why does it look so much better here? Something, something, experimentation, remember? Okay, tangent over. What's next again? Yeah, let's break some rules! <laughs> Fuck, go back! Well, would you look at that? Another Avatar episode. Isn't that just swell? Even though I still dislike it, my thoughts on this episode have softened a lot over the years. But while I think it's pretty overhated because of, let's be real, the verdict, I can't defend the empty animation throughout in the crappy way it ends. Leading up to it, the animation starts to devolve into borderline nonsense. Like, what is up with this sand and these friggin' pillars? Is there some kind of significance to them leaning on each other like this? Then Toph pops up behind Gara, and I can't even tell what's supposed to happen. Gara is covered in sand. Okay, so I have to assume Toph crushes him? 
pardons him? I don't know because they cut away before the actual killing blow happened. I am going to find whoever made this goddamn stock blood splatter effect that shows up everywhere and sent them to Brazil! Poor Chris Guerrero. You could tell he tried his damnedest with the screaming to make the kill feel more impactful, but it's pretty hard to glean anything from this moment when his corpse is completely unchanged between shots. Where did the blood come from? What made Gara scream? Since when could Toph make material so brittle it shatters like glass? Man, looking back on these early episodes really makes a guy appreciate the ramp up and finishers we've seen today. I don't doubt that season 9 will probably invade way more of my best list further down the line after more evaluation time. With some deaths so great, I didn't even need to wait. As for the other direction, well, here's our Omni-Man vs. Homelander entry. Back from the dead, assholes! Now, this episode is good. Great in some cases. After becoming cool again thanks to Mandalorian, it was only fitting that our first death battle loser ever would get his very own run back. But much like with Book of Boba Fett, that good faith did not last forever. Everything after the thermal detonator explosion begins to take a nosedive. The choreography is noticeably less polished. And for some reason, Predator can't see Boba despite it being revealed that his lightsaber sticks out from the flames. Then Boba slashes him, and compared to how it looks in the storyboards, it does not feel all that impactful. Which is a pretty big deal because predators are only supposed to activate their self-destruct when they know they've been defeated. Not as a petty I'm taking you with me kind of move. Bubba gets payback for the loss of his arm, prompting Pred to make this face which is apparently supposed to be a smirk, but he looks bored more than anything. And then we get to the real reason this one found its way so high up the turd totem pole. It commits the cardinal sin that has plagued so many others before it, not showing us what the hell is happening. We get an explosion that looks less powerful than the detonator from before, then we see Bubba walking away panting. So what? What? Did he survive the explosion? Couldn't have, since Wiz and Boomstick said it'd be too much to withstand at its epicenter. The jetpack? Clearly not that either. So I guess he must have run away. I wouldn't be surprised if he got cut for time, but I don't know. I think that would have been kind of cool seeing Bubba weaving his way through the forest like Arnie. Anything to make the pacing feel less disjointed. What exactly does Bubba plan to do with that arm anyway? It's not like he's going to use it as a replacement given it's the wrong side, so... Now I carry around my boyfriend wherever I... I desire. You know, you'd be surprised how well random body parts can stitch themselves back together. I remember one time this psycho British chick stole a bunch of my body parts and they fused together into a whole other me and then that me tried to kill me. Ugh, fangirls, am I right? Seriously, how the heck are you mainstream? I'd like to say it's my devilish charm, but uh, who am I kidding? It's Ryan Reynolds. Gotta love that himbo energy. I realize this was pretty harsh for such a recent episode, but there are so many things wrong that I frankly feel no guilt placing it this high whatsoever. I'll give it this. Cameron as Boba is a baller performance. And seriously, that lightsaber cauterizing has no right to go as hard as it does. Now then, up to this point, I've had at least some nice things to say about our entries, but now that we've entered the bottom five, I won't be nearly as friendly. We're about to talk about when this series has reached its absolute limits when it comes to suckage, especially number one. Strap in, people, because for our first bottom five spot, we gotta travel back to season three. No! <gasps> Oh, okay. Some of you might be wondering why I went with this one of all season three episodes. Why not Cammy, Scout, or even Bowser? Well, decent build up, too boring, and a cool concept. In this case, I want to ask you something. Have you seen Amy Rose vs. Ramona Flowers recently? Because it does not hold up at all. Now, this may perplex some of you, since I didn't even mention this one back in my Season 3 review. I don't watch that video, by the way. It's it's not very good. I'll just bring y'all up to speed here. I mentioned pretty much every episode except this one, and that was because I had little to say about it. Ever since then, it's been in my thoughts. And the more I thought about it, the more I'd begun to realize that I and pretty much the whole community let this piece of shit fly under the radar. This could be due to how forgettable it is, or being in the same season as episodes that are a lot louder with their badness. Whatever the case, this episode is worse than you remember, and a lot of that can be traced to the death. It is so fucking slow. Once Ramona's bag was destroyed, the verdict was pretty clear cut, but the animators must have been getting paid by the second, which would explain why the tornado execution lasts for a solid, honest to God, dead ass, I'm not exaggerating minute of this three minute animation. There's nothing wrong with a beefy climax, but the problem is that there's no tension. We already know Amy is going to win. Ramona is a sitting duck. Literally, she's so brain dead by this point, she can't even tell where she is. And it just keeps going. Holy 
hell it is or a bunch of arcades getting chewed up and spit out over and over. It doesn't know when enough is enough. The pacing gives Venom vs. Bane a run for its money. And yes, I mean the Rooster Teeth version. Unfortunately, in this case, we never got that refined YouTube cut in the end. Crushing to death by arcade machine is creative, but the lead up getting there put such a bad taste in my mouth that it didn't even matter. Earning this one a place in my bottom five. Now, remember when I said Aang vs. Ed was the worst season 6 death? Yeah, I... I lied. There's one more. A particular blemish, in fact, that, while very beautiful, manages to stick its wife's head out. Wines is a standard hoity-toity rich girl. Her special power is losing every single fight she's ever been involved with. Well, obviously this is the only good Ruby episode. It has the only good Ruby girl. Except when that was ruined, too. Though I'll give Bumble... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I threw up a little in my mouth trying to finish that sentence. Though I'll give Yang and Blake credit for having solid finishers despite their lackluster battles. Is that why this death scene is so terrible? To offset the amazing fight and analysis which has one of the best cutaway gags in the show's history to this day? Well, Weiss is a woman of business, so I'm sure she'll understand. Too bad it's this business. Relax, I'm not a tin foiler who thinks Rooster Teeth made death battle neuter the death. Even if it was true, there are much better reasons to despise Rooster Teeth. As I'm sure most of you are aware, this isn't the first time Weiss and Mitsurua fought each other. Remember that crazy crossover Blaze Blue had with Persona and Ruby? Everyone's got an astral finish, so it's only natural to want to adapt that as a finishing move for your animation. It had a strong buildup, and Winter Sonata is a banger track. But they just had to fumble it by not letting Weiss's body shatter with the ice! Imagine if they pulled that shit with Jack and Daxter or Zuko. Even Grey vs. S death felt more like a kill. The impact is now non-existent because it reads much more like a knockout than a kill. The sword breaking was a nice touch, but other than that, this ending was way too weak to be considered a real finisher for this show's standards. Especially in Season 6. Is it possible for this show to get more sterilized? <sighs> Make way for the ponies, everyone. I was honestly surprised by how high this one got. The episode itself is decent by season one standards, and the Sonic Rain Boom is pretty well implemented with the amount of resources Ben had access to. But there's one teensy weensy but ever so crucial little tiny detail. He didn't fucking die! Unlike Deadpool vs. Pinkie Pie, where the twist is that they broke the rules of the show, here they played off like a normal death anyway with the KO transition. And don't forget, according to Ben, KO on this show means killed off. So this episode basically lied to us. So even when taking incorrect verdicts into account, Dash's victory feels like the most unearned on the show because she didn't even accomplish the goal that Death Battle sets out. And I can't even think of a way she could have. Remember, this episode was only going to be made if she was the winner. So by the logic of Death Battle's rules, Starscream vs. Rainbow Dash shouldn't even exist. There was no winner! With Chuck vs. Sagata, they conceded that there's no winner since they're still fighting to this day, and that's the joke. Even Goomba vs. Koopa gave us the courtesy of a double KO to despite being a tie. This episode is the textbook definition of a stalemate, so by being the only episode in the show to do this without any kind of justification or gimmick, that's what ultimately puts it in the bottom three. We like to think that that's a fate worse than death. We've been tricked, we've been backstabbed, and we've been quite possibly Bamboozled. If you want a version of this death done right, look no further than Ultron vs. Sigma. The only reason I left it off last time was because robots don't technically die, so it felt too dubious. But this is pretty much the closest you can get to the death of a program, and it's honestly way scarier in my opinion. Usually anything would be better than nothing, but since this is only number three, it's clear the show found a way to divide by zero. Not only is number two one such mistake, it's also a mistake of mine as well. So allow me to rectify something that should have been fixed a long time time ago. But Nate, you gave this one a 10 out of 10. How could you be so hypocritical? <sighs> okay, look, I don't know what I was smoking when I made that season 5 video. I definitely blinded myself to the quality of this episode simply because it looked cool. And unfortunately, I had a nasty habit of confusing spectacle for substance back then. Well, now that we've gotten more finales with both of those qualities, it stripped this fight of any goodwill I had before for it. It's not good. It's quite bad, even. In fact, I'd go as far as to say the death is the worst in the series from a quality standpoint. You trapped Thanos in a dimension where he's supposed to die an infinite number of times. The possibilities are literally limitless. And what do they show us? Deadpool again, shooting Thanos with a gun that doesn't even leave a visible wound on him. All the potential in the world and it is squandered for a cheap bottom of the barrel punchline that takes place in a backgroundless area. Our season finale, everyone. 
one. Not even Darkseid can save this moment because he keeps getting overshadowed by Deadpool's shenanigans. Thank God this show puts you on a leash. Man, can we please not talk about this episode? Looking back on it just gives me so much secondhand embarrassment. Oh wow, wait, I had no idea. I mean, I could have done so much more to show that plum-headed Simpsons knockoff what for? Grenades, rocket launchers, I've got a titan-sized bear trap with his literal name on it. Ah, uh, yeah, there it is. If there's anything slightly positive about the death, it'd be this shot of Wade whipping out his piece and Curtis Arnott's delivery. And that's mostly just because I'm a sucker for memes that involve characters pulling out a gun. But even then, those jokes only work for characters we don't associate with guns. So it's not nearly as funny here in comparison. How did I defend this crap? There is only one thing that keeps it from being at the bottom of the barrel. But before we get to that, it's time to look at which entries got spared from a first class ass kicking. So they'll have to settle for economy ass kicking. Lightning round time. Far too abrupt and does nothing to help this episode's painful mediocrity. The single laser is so pitiful, no pun intended. There had to have been a better way to cap off the solid buildup. It's no secret how much this episode disrespects Mikey, and the death does little to assuage that. It's a really cool idea and concept, but the execution is so confused. What was stopping Jiraiya from just moving out of the way? The meteor was a neat surprise and had decent foreshadowing, but it feels a bit too mellow overall and lacking in impact. Even without comparing Raiden's last fight, this sword duel explosion should not feel as weak as it does. Also, the final bit with the foundry felt out of place. Tries its best to be a fake out death, but fails when Knuckles was clearly shown being reduced to red mist beforehand. Too sudden and out of nowhere, spooky scary skeletons. The buildup is brutal and intense, but I can't take the kill seriously with how it compares to the game version visually. Oh, I'm still reeling over how dumb this is. You use two characters that scream their opponents to death and opt for the tamest possible closer. What is your malfunction? Never mind, clearly the malfunction lies here. How do you make an ultra combo boring? I hate mentioning this one because the visuals are amazing and the music is godlike, but then it ends with a pretty weak kick and just fizzles out. Sad it couldn't live up to its own hype. He's just standing there. STUPIDLY! Not bad in a vacuum, horrendous when you know who the characters are. Just barely missed the top 25. Okay, I'm feeling it. The build-up's cool, the stakes are high, and it's gone. It's gone. It's absolutely gone. It's ruined. Unsalvageable. Kill it with fire, please. For the love of God, please just let one Mortal Kombat character get a good kill on this show! Just one! Despite how pretty it is, the visuals do a poor job conveying how the final clash actually plays laid out. At first it seems like they were both dunked to the ground, but then Asta falls relatively gently afterwards and we see Deku hovering in place. Supposedly Deku dies here, and that would have been an interestingly somber way to end it, but then Asta acts like an asshole by stabbing his corpse, which from what I've heard is super out of character. The ending is one big and confusing missed opportunity, but luckily Mr. Satan saves it, as is customary for the guy. And last but not least, every single vaporization slash explosion that's too boring to talk about substantially. Alright, I think that's everything. I would have brought up the 7 Battle Royale, but that would require acknowledging its existence, so no thank you. We've talked about a lot of different characters getting disrespected in various ways. Whether it's butchering their personalities, not showing the full extent of their arsenals, or just straight up making them into complete jokes. I'm thankful none of these characters are real, because I'm sure they'd be pretty offended by how they were presented. Rightfully so! But hey, at the end of the day, no matter how attached we are to these characters and their stories, it's all still fiction. Fans might get a little upset, but at least no one's really getting hurt. It's one thing to bully a character. 
It's a horse of a different color when reality is involved. My number one is Justin Bieber vs. Rebecca Black, and I knew right from the get-go when making this list that it would take the top spot handily. I'm not singling out any of the multiple deaths in particular, by the way. I mean this episode's climax in its entirety. On its own, the deaths are at least varied with some understanding of comedic timing, but that doesn't mask what this climax, as well as the episode as a whole, represents fundamentally. It doesn't matter how many disclaimers you put at the beginning or different ways you try to spin it as satire, this episode is cyberbullying. Bullying. It was solely made to kill two real-life people just for making popular music. Now, do I like their music? No. Do I consider Justin or Rebecca perfect people? Not particularly. But that's not the point. These are real-life people with real, tangible feelings like you and me. Not to mention they were kids at the time. Considering the amount of hate they had already been getting and continue to get for their work, the last thing they needed was a hit piece designed to give plebeians a power fantasy of watching people more successful than themselves get brutally murdered. Because as long as we're punching up, that makes it okay, right? You know what, at the end of the night, when you come home, the only value this episode has is serving as a time capsule for a bygone era of the internet, and a reminder of what Death Battle could have become had they continued down this road. The entire attitude of this episode, whether it's seeing these pop stars butchered or having to deal with our host's insufferable envy, is a slog to sit through. If it was released now, I wouldn't be shocked if YouTube took it down for violating their community guidelines. Now that's not to say I can't appreciate satire, but in order to truly be called satire, it has to have a point beyond, let's kill this guy because we find them slightly annoying. We simply must defend our toxic masculinity. And I'm not saying Justin or Rebecca can't handle a roast either, but those are made out of love and genuine respect. And the one getting roasted always has the last laugh in the end. What do you get when you give a teenager $200 million? A bunch of has-beens calling you a lesbian for two hours. <laughs> This product does not feel like it comes from a place of love. It represents hate, spite, and everything I despise about the early internet. But before I sign off, I know what some of you might be thinking. Since Justin Bieber vs. Rebecca Black has my least favorite death, does that mean it's also my least favorite episode? Yes! Obviously! It's not even a contest, nor should there be a debate! The fact that this isn't everyone's least favorite is honestly kind of concerning! Now, now, Nate, be reasonable. Aren't you the one always saying that different opinions matter? No, 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 shut, 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 fuck up! I don't care! I do not care! You don't understand! It is objective fact! I don't care what anyone says! That means nothing! Nothing to me. It means nothing to me, all right? You at home, your opinion means nothing to me. Anyone who says this isn't the worst episode is wrong. Plain and simple. You can talk to your little friends and say, oh, this episode didn't utilize enough of their power ups, or this verdict is wrong, or this one made fun of my favorite character too much. That does not compare to an episode using real life kids and murdering them just for following their dreams. There will never ever be another episode that reaches the same level of. My disgust. God, he's fucking losing it entirely. Black. Fuck this episode in the Hayfield limo we wrote it on. What do we want? Watching Glee? Okay then, sensitive subject, got it. Oh man, I'm sorry about that, Wade. I really didn't mean to get so heated. It's just this episode and what it does to you. But you know what? It's the holidays. I don't want to end this video on such a downer note. I got you a little special something for the season two, Wade. Wait, really? This better not be some kind of prank. Perish the thought. In fact, it's something you've been asking for for a while now. Wait a minute. You don't mean... Raccoon Bro and I talked it out, and we got you some custom artwork, buddy. Oh, yes! Finally! Let's do this thing! I'm a ready! Transformation Central! I can feel it! Nate, where are my legs? Welcome to my world.